<laughs> so this is Pella Thiel from Transition Network Sweden and I'm here with Brian Walker, famous researcher in complexity and resilience at the uh, Resilience Conference in <coughs> Stockholm. And uh, wh why do you think we need a conference like this? Well, because uh, I think, first of all, we've got to try and get other people engaged in thinking. The Resilience Alliance and the people who are embedded in that work haven't got all the answers by any means. So we need to engage, share ideas, create new options, meet new people so that we get the synergy that comes out of, of a lawyer talking to an ecologist, which you don't normally get. So these conferences are very important for those kinds of reasons. Mm. So the Transition Network is um, uh, a global movement of um, people engaging in building resilience locally. Can you see, I mean, what, what, what role do you see movements and, and people like that having? Because we're living in a very complex time and very challenging and changing time. We are, and, and I think the, the, the idea of local movements in, in, uh, are really, really important because we're almost locked in in so many ways globally and nationally to current ways of doing things. It's a top-down controlled way with current economic systems and policies that are very, very hard to change. And the only way to, to, to actually do a change is in a bottom-up movement. We have to create a groundswell and an understanding that actually this isn't the way the world works and that we're not doing very well by adopting this rigid policy-driven particular objective that people are in the short term. They're all short term driven because of quarterly reports and annual objectives and all of this drives you down particular closed pathways. And that's not the way the world works. And to try and change that kind of thinking is really important. So if there was a kind of a little phrase that you would put above all of this if you were thinking about how do you start getting into the ideas of a resilience approach to this, it, it would be embrace uncertainty. And, and that gives the shivers to anybody in a bureaucracy or anybody because they don't want uncertainty. They want to reduce all the uncertainty and to keep things absolutely under control. That's what reduces resilience. So resilience is necessarily an ongoing learning process with a great deal of uncertainty. So policies and management that say um, what we do is we're going to take this system and this is the way we're going to manage it because that's our objective and we're going to guide and shift and change and, and do that to reach this objective at that amount of time. Those are almost bound to fail because what you think is the appropriate objective is changes as the context of the world changes and if you're not prepared to adapt and change then you're never going to reach it anyway. So another way of looking at the world that I think resilience offers is to say don't think of the world as as a stationary way of some particular area and you're going to try and optimize a particular product from it because that won't work. Try and envisage the world as an oncoming stream of opportunities and hazards and the objective is to, insofar as possible, avoid the hazards and seize the opportunities. There's not one particular goal that you're trying to do. Things will happen that you never expected and they can provide a hazard or an opportunity. Can we learn enough about complex systems to begin to distinguish between those? When is it something we need to avoid and not go over that threshold and become locked into something really bad? When is it an opportunity that might be fleeting? But if you're not prepared to take an opportunity, most bureaucracies would take ages to get an approval process. You'd have to go through several sign-offs and all the... By the time you've got permission to do something, the opportunity's gone. Yeah. So how can you retain the flexibility in a kind of a forward-moving way? That's the way resilience practice works in a complex adaptive system. Right. You don't know what's going to happen. The fundamental difference, I suppose, is, is the difference between complicated and complexity. And, and a watch is a complicated thing. It's full of all sorts of moving parts and that. But it's entirely predictable because you know exactly what happens if one part changes. A complex adaptive system, you do not. It's unpredictable. If you change one part of it, it has multiple connections with other parts. And you have no idea 
what the consequences are of interfering with one particular part. But you've got to try and understand the dynamics and the progression and the pathway that you learn as you learn to live in and adapt and manage a complex adaptive system. Right. Actually, uh, that's what I like about a movement, the grassroots movement. That I mean, I agree. We all have that uh, experience with with bureaucracies. That's really frustrating. It takes too much time, so you don't, mm -hmm. you can't take an opportunity. But people can do that. They can uh, move much faster. Um, but I'm thinking it's not just bureaucrats that hate uncertainty. I guess we all yeah. have difficulties I with know. that. Yep. So how how do we how do we allow for uncertainty? How can we be comfortable? Do you think with uncertainty? There's no real clear answer to that, and I understand exactly what you you saying. Especially as we get older, we want certainty in our lives. But so young people deal with it much better than old people, mm. for example. But I think it's the same thing from a bottom-up process to a top process. The top scale of a of a country or an organisation really doesn't like uncertainty. Down at the bottom, it's not so bad, and it's the same kind of process. Now, I don't know how you can try and change the mindset to embrace uncertainty, mm -hmm. but only by showing it in a number of examples. And if we could just collect those together at local places and how uncertainty played out and those who were acceptable of uncertainty then survived it and those who refused to admit it, who didn't want to recognize it, came unstuck basically. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. that kind of, and there are examples. And if we could just get those collected together in, in a local network, then, then it's the whole idea. And I love the word transitioning because you're never going to get a single change. It's going to be a transitioning process, yeah. and and that is a learning process, yeah. and it's a requirement that you extend the ideas and you gradually get a bottom-up movement to beginning to think like this. And as you begin to think like that, it becomes more of a social norm. It's a little bit like non-smoking. Yeah. To begin with, non-smoking was really resisted by smokers, mm -hmm. but as it started to gain ground, more and more people um, frowned upon people smoking. So in fact. Um, you didn't feel comfortable smoking and in the end it became a cultural shift and so how do we get the beginning of normative behavior yeah. to accept complexity and uncertainty mm. and as that spreads it will become part of our culture and I think we need a culture of uncertain accepting uncertainty and complexity mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that 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 cultural shift is also really dependent on a change in the dominant culture at the moment which has ex which has evolved through the economic system and uh, for about the last 25 years and i think it was quite frankly for me it was the thatcher reagan administration time where it became okay to be greedy mm. and um, it was all right to this notion of the trickle down effect would somehow solve all problems, so let the rich get richer. Now that's been disproved again and again by good economists, but the idea keeps getting raised by the people who are gaining from all of this. But that notion of how do you, how do you change that culture? So I think the problem with the culture at the moment, it's a culture of me. Everything is about me. Mm -hmm. And we have to change that to a culture of we. Yeah where it's a social thing, where, where what you do affects me and yeah. my benefits mm. and your benefits collectively. So even if it is me mm -hmm. that you're most concerned about, the best way of ensuring that me yeah. will do well is to be in a society of we who right. are all doing well. Yeah. And so I think a cultural shift, which a transition movement is really aimed at, I think, yeah. is to shift from being me, me, me right. to we. Yeah. And how do we get that cultural shift going other than through a transition movement and a group and it's got to be bottom up social media all of that mm. if we could get that in place we would begin to understand better how complexity works because it's it? all the relationships between yeah. us we so uh, that's what i would like to see it's wonderful we actually call it a, a global social experiment because really oh we, well that's wonderful we don't know yeah. what it is yet <laughs> it's developing all the time that's great i'm yeah. glad you don't know what it is yet this is this is wonderful it's unfolding <laughs> isn't it yeah. thanks a lot <laughs> that's a pleasure <laughs>